trauma of the paradoxical effect of the tranquilizer causing to run around and not sleep for an entire week. Uh, hyperactivity is prescribed psychostimulants because it slows us down and tranquilizers will, will rub us up. Those of you who are in relationships with ADHD can attest that distractibility is probably one of the biggest factors leading to conflict in relationships. Okay, as Ruth starts talking, I've asked her a question very pointedly about really caring about what she has to say, but my brain all of a sudden remembers that I forgot to get some water. Something, and then shiny object syndrome comes through, and we, we have every intention in the world when we started the project. AD, true ADHD is a neurological issue, and we are born with it. So why is it that so many adults are being diagnosed in recent years? Well, there's actually science that supports when you, and, and, and here, here's the deal. Those of you who have been diagnosed as adults more than likely have very highly intelligent brains, okay? And the reason why I can conclude that is because it's your cognitive abilities, it's your intelligence, it's your problem-solving capacity that has allowed you to develop coping behaviors throughout your lifetime to float under the radar undiagnosed, okay? You probably, if you think back, have always had some kind of issues in relationships and school functioning, self-esteem issues, Things always seem a little bit harder for you, but you didn't have the legitimacy of a diagnosis. Why? Because your intelligently smart brain was able to figure out how to deal with things to be able to skate under the radar, okay? But now, we're living in an age where our senses and nervous system is assaulted by stimulus, stimuli all day long. And what do we do for that? We eat crap food, we, we <laughs> pour ourselves full of caffeine because we get inadequate sleep, okay? And, and we, we pay hundreds and thousands of dollars for gym memberships that we never use. <laughs> I, I wanna get through these really quickly because self-care is a really long word and that's the acronym I came up with. <laughs> so sleep, exercise is the second one. Out laughing. <laughs> the things that we're known the most for with biofeedback and neurofeedback, neurofeedback across the board, most efficacious, most researched, ADHD. It's the early 50s. Uh, both biofeedback and neurofeedback have been around for many years. With biofeedback, what it actually means is that we use machines to see how your body responds to what you're thinking so that you can change what you're thinking or your moods to get your body to respond. So if you think about it with like migraines or with pain, I, what we're doing is moving the blood flow in your body and relaxing those muscles. So when we hook the machines onto you and you can see exactly what your body's doing, you can see when you're tensing those muscles so you can recognize that, you can see when you're relaxing those muscles, you change what you're doing. It can be breathing, it could be visualization, it could be a lot of muscle relaxation things. Anything that's gonna make those muscles relax, it's gonna get you that relief from the pain that you've had before. Um, it's similar with the headaches, with the migraines. You get any kind of tension headache, you know, you get that constricted blood, blood flow in your head and it starts to almost throb sometimes. When you can start learning to move that blood down to your hands, which is what we teach people, you start getting relief from it. So it's all about the machinery, hence the engineer to the biofeedback, because I'm really about the equipment. <laughs> it's very cool what we can do with it. Um, neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback, to use, it's all about the brain waves, where you're retraining your own brain. Everything that I do, I'm pretty much a coach, and you do it all. But with the, with the neurofeedback, you're actually changing your brain to rehardwire itself. Um, part of what we do with traditional biofeedback, besides for the hand temperature, we do a lot of heart rate work, we do a lot of skin conductance, because when 
with the whole fight or flight response, when you get stressed, you get cold and clammy hands because the blood leaves your extremities, goes to your large muscles so you can run, and you get those nice clammy hands from the sweat in your hands. So we're watching those bodily functions that you don't think you normally have control over, and we're giving you control. So are we watching her brain work? We're watching her brain dead center on her head. Ooh, it's laughing for a minute. What happened there? <laughs> That's the movement. If, yeah, if you, if you move at all, then we start getting movement. This is her raw brain wave up here. These are the waves broken up. Oh, you are in good shape. Um, the top ones are the gamma, the high beta. But I was talking about that other form of ADHD. Normally, we see a lot of this dark blue, which is that theta wave that I was talking about, that slow wave. There's an alternative form that we see occasionally, and it's those people that you know that the medication won't work for them. It sort of exasperates the problem. They have far too much of this high beta. The high beta is a, almost like a high strung kind of wave. We all need some, but we don't need a lot of it. When I have a lot of pain with someone, we see a ton of that in the brain, because that's how the brain's coping with it, is an awful lot of that high beta. But I do see a, our fair share, especially with the cocaine addicts, a lot of that high beta form. Hence, a stimulant's never going to do it. It's only going to make things much worse. Um, underneath it is the beta, which is what you fire when you're doing something. If you're throwing a ball, you're riding a bike. Underneath that is the green. The green is what we usually work on a lot when we're trying to work on focus issues. It's a relaxed concentration. We call it low beta. It's being alert and awake. The easiest way to equate it is if you're playing baseball and you were throwing the ball, the pink would fire. But if you're that guy on second base just waiting for something to happen, that's when you're firing the green. Think too hard, go up. Doze off, go down. It's really hard to stay in that place, but it's the optimal place that we always want to be with focus issues. Underneath that is the alpha, which is what you fire when you meditate. When you first relax to fall asleep, when you visualize. Underneath that is that theta. Theta is great in the back of the brain. It's a good deep meditation. It should be really strong in the back of the brain, but for anybody who has focus issues, there's usually a widespread excess of it in the brain. And we're trying to calm that down. With this patient, you see a hole here, which is not a real hole, but it's an area of under perfusion, which appears like that on the multiple threshold of volume. And then we have the fanciest one and one of the most useful on the surface image in which you reconstruct the surface and dump the Elsewhere tonight, it's a disability usually associated with children, but attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is not just a school age issue anymore. An increasing number of adults are getting the ADHD diagnosis. CBS 2's Dana Kozloff reports confronting the disorder head on can change lives. Trouble focusing, easily distracted, restless, do you daydream or have bouts of anxiety? Donna Tagg says all of those issues and more impatient, frustrated, lose temper quickly, are on her personal list of life issues, literally. And I just sort of took down notes for myself about what I thought applied to me. Those notes served quite a purpose. Last summer, the 52-year-old lifelong Chicagoan was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. She wasn't surprised. Her 15-year-old son, Christopher, was diagnosed as a child. Tag's issues mirrored some of his. So was it sort of a relief then, almost? It was a relief because it took away some of the feelings of guilt about my personality faults. Are more adults now being diagnosed with ADD and ADHD than 10 years ago? Yes, it's probably the largest group that's being identified now. ADHD expert Dr. Mark Stein says that's due in part to increased awareness that the disorder doesn't just affect children. In fact, Stein says one in 25 adults has ADHD, which is frequently found in other family members too. It's not just having the symptoms, it's having symptoms that result in some impairment. That impairment almost derailed 47-year-old Ruth Princess's life. At one point, things got so bad, I thought I had a stroke, and I didn't know what this was called. Word recall wasn't her only problem. She couldn't find things and would lose total track of time. Since her diagnosis eight years ago, Princess has learned coping strategies. Things like setting a timer. And attend support groups like this one to keep working on ways to manage the disability. It's not so much, oh, I have a disorder. It's these are where my assets are, these are where my deficits are. 
Donna Tague is starting that journey now. She's attacking it with a positive point of view. I would forget the thought about labeling. Labels will last for two minutes, but the help can change your whole life. Dr. Stein points out that ADHD symptoms are different for different people, but if you're concerned, see your doctor to rule out other issues first. I find that there, there was very little known about ADHD in adults, um, and so we started an adult ADHD clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, we've learned more about ADHD in adults, but we still know very little. If you have a child that has ADHD, there's a 25% like chance that a parent's going to have it. Um, so it's a disorder that runs in families, and we've known that for some time, but yet we haven't translated that into terms of how we treat ADHD. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm at University of Illinois Medical School, and, um, you know, every three months I get 40 more medical students. And um, I'm trying to, to increase their awareness of ADHD that's just not the seven-year-old boys. And even if you're you know, a pediatric resident and you're with a seven-year-old boy, you want to screen the parents for ADHD because if the parent isn't treated, that's going to limit how, how much better the child is going to get. Mm -hmm. um, the evidence-based treatments for ADHD, there are three. Um, stimulant medication, and we'll talk about that in some detail. Um, psychosocial treatment, which means parent training, behavior modification, and then the third is the combination of medication and psychosocial treatment. Now, who do you think delivers behavior modification or medication to a child with ADHD? Parents. Parents. And what if the parent has ADHD? <laughs> you might forget to give it to her. Let's <laughs> focus. When we evaluate someone for ADHD, we don't just ask about what's wrong and what the symptoms are. We, we ask, what is Johnny good at? And in terms of long-term benefit, you're going to get more out of building on what they're good at uh, than focusing on the negatives. You know, a lot of the things that children have that are problems, it's hard to fix. But building on what their strengths are, is, you know, is huge. So if you have a child, the people, though, that treat adults, they're, they're just now realizing that ADHD is a common disorder, that, you know, 4% of adults have ADHD. But, um, you know, so in my medical school, they get one lecture from me for a day, the psychiatry residents. Uh, but they spend weeks learning about schizophrenia and weeks learning about bipolar disorder. Um, so we're, we're trying to change that. And with my clinic, you know, we're having them rotate through where they're, they're learning more about it. But a lot of psychiatrists were trained 10 or 20 years ago when they, there wasn't such a thing as ADHD in adults. And um, so, so many adults with ADHD might be misdiagnosed as having bipolar illness or um, uh, hypomanic episodes or depression, which might be due to the ADHD. So there's some controversy, there, there's a problem with training. Paul Zintarski is the brains behind the program. He was the physical education coordinator here for 26 years. He says some teachers were skeptical when he first came up with the idea. They were afraid that the kids would be so hyped up coming out of PE, going into the next class, that they wouldn't be able to teach them well. So yeah, skeptical, absolutely. They thought we were weird. But in the six years since the program began, the results speak for themselves. On average, kids who signed up for physical education directly before reading comprehension read half a year ahead of those who opted out of the exercise program. Point one and in math, the improvements were even more dramatic. Students with the benefit of PE before pre-algebra consistently did better improving two to four times more than their peers on standardized tests. It's something that Zintarski thinks other educators need to know about. Rady tells us the science goes like this. When you exercise, the first thing that happens is neurotransmitters are released into the brain, keeping us awake and alert. Then, after a few minutes, exercise stimulates our nerve cells to grow and connect, creating the perfect environment for learning. I called it miracle growth for the brain, which means that it's brain fertilizer. So it helps our brain cells stay young and perky, and it also helps our brain cells do what they're supposed to do when we learn, which is to grow. I say it's not voodoo, it's really based on science. Paul Zintarski is using this information to get parents and educators excited about following the Naperville model. This is what I present to parents when I'm trying to convince them about the program. If you would have ever told me that I would have gone into, into the neuroscience 
of the brain, no way. No